Hello, spooky friends, and welcome to another episode of the Scariest Podcast. Woo! <laughs> I just wanted to. You joined me. Yeah, for I once. wanted to join you. In Took that 148 one. episodes. Oh, you know what? Dang it! I should have saved it for 150. Oh well, it's too late now. <laughs> we'll have to do something extra special for 150. All right. Um, I'm Robin Grace. This is Adam Diaz. Hello. And today, like. Many other episode days, we're here to talk about some interesting topics. I think every other episode day, unless we had a day where we preface like, we're here to talk about some boring, basic bitch shit, which I don't think we've done. So I'm pretty excited about my topic. Uh, I didn't know if it would cover like the full length that a normal topic does. And then I found some really interesting stuff. So I'm very excited. I'm covering a UFO that happened uh, back home at O'Hare International Airport. Nice. Robin, what are you going to be covering this week? Uh, I'm going to be covering a supposedly haunted house. Interesting. Uh, I believe you're going to be the person who goes first. If uh, I'm not correct about that, feel free to let me know. Yep. That's I'm, how it goes. Yes, how I'm not correct, it. or yes, no, I am no. correct. I'm going first. Okay, cool. Well, then I'll let you take it away. Okay. It's very late. I'm what's very with tired. Your, I was like, what's with all your voices? I'm so tired right now, man. <laughs> So we are staying stateside this week. I've been doing a lot of um, foreign countries lately, I feel like. Interesting take on um, it. I suppose you have come to think of it. Yeah. A, a lot of places that I've done are, have been like UK or I've done, what is it? Like Romania or something recently. And Eastern I, Europe. Yeah. Eastern, a lot of Eastern Europe. Uh, and you know what? I, I figured I'm going to stay here in the US today. We're right gonna, on. Which is, but it's funny because the, one of the people in this actually came from Europe, so it's going to be like a little mix. There We're always seems both. to be some sort of connection, but um, I think that's good. It like attaches more of the listener base together that way. Yeah, and I, I definitely wanted to, I mean, give a little bit of the ghosts that we have here a little bit of attention because they're probably like, why did you ever talk about us? So like, <laughs> give a little bit of oh your my love gosh. to I, me. Dang it. Like there, oh, okay, everything we say, there's probably a lyric for it out there. If Blind Manor has taught me anything, it's that ghosts all have their own stories. Blind Manor taught you that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not Haunting of Hill House? And Haunting of Hill House. But, we, but seriously, Season we, one was better than season two. We, we just watched the entirety of The Haunting of Blind Manor, and uh, you folks should let us know what you guys thought of it, because... Uh, you can let us know on Facebook or Discord or whatnot, but we definitely have a lot of thoughts on it. I feel like we stayed up till five that Friday, and yeah. then we like finished it up the next day. Here's what I will um, say about Haunting of Bly Manor. If there was not a season called Haunting of Hill House, I would have liked Haunting of Bly Manor even more. Because Haunting of Hill House, to me, season one was so strong, I was sort of looking for some elements that were similar. And it is kind of a very different show. I describe it, it as more a of a slow show. burn. Yeah. I will say there was a part that scared Robin so bad she threw her coffee all over the ground yep. herself. So. <laughs> there was a jump scare and I spilled coffee all over the living room floor. I was floor. telling her repeatedly, like, I got a coaster ready for him. Like, set your co- set your coffee down. Please set your coffee down. And of course, like, Bleh! And it was just everywhere. <laughs> I was like, damn it. It was, yeah, it was. But, it was, I mean, the show was... Not the best, but it was good. It, it was good in its own way because it's a different show entirely. I will say this season seemed to focus more on story than yes. on scares. Yeah. There's also some scares to be had. Though. There are some scares in the beginning, I it's feel It's definitely like. the first, like, the first half of the season is, I think, scarier than the second half. Yeah. The second half does give you quite a bit of resolution, though, that I, I just, I get annoyed when shows keep introducing question after question after question i'm like just give me some fucking answers and those answers do come at some point though so i was happy about that yeah um the people that are gonna watch this way down the line are like blind man or blood it was the worst season of the haunting (laughs) series um but no yeah man just look for the ghosts that's all i do the entire season is look for ghosts why she gets shocked by things in the foreground because she's paying nothing but all of her attention to the background background, yeah so when something jumps in the foreground i'm like jerry's awesome and she doesn't pay attention to the story because she's like wait where'd that person come from it's like they've been there the entire time it's like oh i was looking for ghosts uh all right so anyway what it comes down to is it's taught me that any place can be a sinister one even a crumbling house on a hill in Kansas City. Kansas. Kansas can, I was going to say Kansas City, Kansas <laughs> or Kansas City, Missouri. Oh, we had to I had to ask Adam earlier. I was like, is Kansas City in Kansas? Um, but this particular Kansas City is on the Kansas side. 
Um, there is a house on a hill, not Hill House, overlooking the Kansas River called Sauer Castle. Does that is that S O U R? S A U E R. Sauer Castle. Gotcha. Sauer Castle. It's German. Okay, so if they made candy, it would be called Sauer Candy. It's such a terrible song. I like that song. And why didn't you say anything? That's right. Because you're it's terrible. Dumb. You started listening to the song in your brain. Two thumbs down. All right. So though it's called a castle, it's not like any castle that you're probably imagining right now. Um, you're probably imagining some big old mansion type Parapets, thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, this one does have a pretty creepy tall tower to it, but it only has one, and it's uh not that big a house. It's pretty small. <laughs> it sounds like Sour Tower is what it should oh have been called, God. but it has like you know a house around it. Um, the place is probably a gothic dream home to many. The 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 architecture and stuff like that. If it had been kept up and taken care of, it would be so nice and pretty. And the it's just how it was built is crazy. It looks cool. I love it. I mean, it would be cool, too, if it weren't haunted. But I might even be interested. I, I might have been interested in, like, maybe we should buy that house if it weren't so tone up from the flow up. You know tone what up? I mean? Tore up? Yeah. Tore up from the floor up. <laughs> is that what it is? Tone yeah. up. I don't know. I say torn up. Uh, <laughs> it sounded like you said tone up, like T O N E. So I'm like, so it's really ripped. This house is in uh, good shape, huh? No, no, it's not. It's really bad. For a structure built sometime between 1869 and 1871, though, it's pretty idyllic. Um, it's been standing for 150 years, you know? So for 150 years, I would say it's a win for how it looks. Because I imagine if this house stood for 150 years, I don't think it would look that good. I think it's so funny we consider things like that in America. Where, like, when we do stories in the UK, it's like, so this place has been there since 900 AD. (laughs) And it's still there. And we're like, this house made it 12 years. Not bad. Smoke detectors are going, though. (laughs) It's a real story. That's a real story. Our smoke detectors went off at, like, 5 in the morning last night. So we're just like, (laughs) meh. There was no fire. There was no... There was no fire. Our smoke detectors are just really old. There's no carbon monoxide. They're just starting um, to die, so they randomly go off at the worst possible times. All right. So, for a house that's been around for 150 years, it's bound to have some metaphorical skeletons in its closet and some not-so-metaphorical spirits all up in its halls. The story of the house at 935 Shawnee Road. Um, yes, its address is totally available, like on the, their government website I'm and all that sure stuff. I'm pretty sure when I was a kid, I grew up on Shawnee. Really? <laughs> yeah. In Portage, Indiana. Different place, but still. Are they are they connected? No, I don't okay. think so. <laughs> cool. I don't know where any of the states are. All I know is Hawaii is in the ocean and Washington and Oregon and California are West Coast. That's pretty good. That's <laughs> And Texas is down at the bottom there somewhere. Alaska's up there. But all the states in between I'm really, really, really bad at. Representing Americans very well right now. (laughs) All right. So the story of this house all starts with the original owner of the home, Anton Philip Sauer. He sounds evil. (laughs) I think that his full name was actually Anthony, too, but I'm not sure. Some some say it's Anthony. Some say just Anton. It's, It's I'm not sure. Um. He was, he was a transplant from Germany, so he did come from Germany. That's the European in the story. Um, he came to America from Austria with his wife, Francesca, in the 1860s. Um, his story with this home began after having moved to Kansas City from New York after his wife passed in 1868. That's sad. Um, it, it, they got married when they were 18, too. So Aww. they were really young. Um, well, I mean, back then you lived till you were like 28, I think, so. <laughs> All these, a lot of the members of this family live till they're like 80 or 90 or something. Wow, spoiler yeah. alert. Sorry. Um, anyway, he was a businessman who happened to have tuberculosis, which made him kind of have to make the decision of moving west, which is what a lot of people did that contracted TV. They're just like, we gotta, we gotta go to where the air is better or something like that. Or drier. Drier Drier climates. I think Kansas is still pretty moist. So really? Yeah. I would have kept heading west if I were him. (laughs) Well, uh, he moved to Kansas city there. He met a woman named Mary Messer Schmidt. She was 28. Also a German immigrant. 
and a widow herself. So they were like two peas in a little pod. Twinsies. It was, it's just like, what are the odds that you would meet someone just everything that you would want, you know? Uh, not that you would want someone who's a widow, but like that similar circumstances as you. Right. The two of them married in 1869. Nice. Um, (laughs) they were, they got married pretty quick. Um, it was kind of like the Brady Bunch because she had two daughters. He had five kids of his own. They got together. Um, he did make pretty good money. He made money from like his tannery, from grocery, uh, from varying freight interests. He was a pretty good businessman. He had a lot of money so he He could support. Diversified portfolio. Yeah. He could support, um, all these people. And you know, you want to know what else they did? They had another five fucking kids. I was going to say, did they, Fook? <laughs> they had another five kids. So they had 12 kids. These two people had 12 kids in their house. I, my mind is blown by the idea of having two kids running around, let alone 12. 12. Well, you just start having, um, like, the older ones raise the middle ones and the middle ones raise the younger ones. So Yeah, that's true. They And they only had daughters. They had five more daughters. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, one of their daughters did die while she was a baby within the home and then was actually buried on the grounds. That's sad. Um, so the story about that is like, um, Anton had tuberculosis. He was really sick and he was dying. So when their daughter died, he was, he was, you know, on his deathbed kind of thing. And they were like, well, he's going to pass soon. So we'll just bury her on the property for now. And then, uh, when he died, they buried her with him. Yes. So they, they... When he died, they buried him in the Union Hill Cemetery, and they reburied her next to him um, in 1979. So that's... Or 1879? 1879. He didn't live 100 some long years, right? I was going to say, wow, Um, he lasted pretty long with TV. No, 1879. So that's um, sad, but at the same time, uh, kind of nice that they were able to be buried together like that. That being said, there are rumors... (laughs) rumors uh being the key word that every member of the sour family is buried on the property of the estate somewhere and and that's purely speculation on a bunch of people's parts because there's no way it's like they just added that detail into the story once they heard that this place was supposedly haunted the family's huge <laughs> just like you just I run out of plots you'd be like <laughs> i don't know can we get it on this grave um, whatever that's a line from A Million Ways to Die in the West, if you guys have never seen that. Anyway. Um, <laughs> if you've never seen that, watch it, then re-listen to all our episodes. And then and you'll the be first like, hundred oh, will yeah. make a lot more sense. Um, five generations of this family lived within this home. So that's a lot of generations just continually kind of taking over this land and this house and taking care of everything that has to do with it you're probably going to get to it so let me just ask a general version of this question um the hauntings that are to come did they start early or did they develop later they they develop later because they're the first ones to build this house okay cool because i was wondering if they started early like if they built the house moved in and it was already haunted it's gonna be like there are some horrors in this house that was your joke when we started watching blind manor so i I totally usurped that from you all right so Five generations lived in this house. Mary lived there, the wife, lived there until she died in 1919 of a fractured hip from a fall at her daughter um, Ava's home. So she didn't even die in their home. Um, She was 79, so a fall to the... uh, And breaking your hips, pretty big deal, especially... Uh, in 1919, when they don't have all the technology that they have they now. They didn't even have sliced bread yet, um, so. What? So it's like 1926 or oh, something. All shit. I know is that Betty White is older than sliced bread. Yes, I don't, she is. I don't know when sliced bread was, was I don't know, invented. But... Well, you continue with your story, and Adam and his well, little okay. Google machine are so going to find out right now. So the thing with that is, any loaf of bread you slice is sliced bread. Like, it came pre-sliced. Oh, what gotcha. About. Okay. It's not like someone just invented slicing off bread. <laughs> Everyone was just ripping shit off. I was pretty fucking um, close. It was 1928 is when it first started being sold sliced. Nice. Okay. So, there was definitely tragedy um, in this family. I, I mean, with a family that lives so long and has so many generations and so many members to it, it's bound to happen. 
Anton's infant great-granddaughter, Cecilia, is said to have drowned in the pool. Um, Julius, one of the original Sauer's children, died in 1897 in a high-speed train collision. Holy shit. Um, I don't know how fast trains went in 19 or 1897, but... I will say, tragic as though it seems... It's a pretty badass thing to have on your tombstone. <laughs> Died in Died a high speed <laughs> train collision in like 1896. I see that and I'm like, holy shit, what was this guy doing? I don't know. He was 47 when it happened. Wow. Um, Emil, one of their other kids, died in his early 20s in 1875, supposedly due to tuberculosis. I don't know how you contract it. Contract TV. it? Yeah, I don't know how you contract it. Um, There's a lot of ways, but honestly, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. We should... Haven't we done a TV episode? Maybe not. Um, hey, it's your research paper. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is on you. Um, Well, I'm sure we'll do something in the future that has us explain that. One of the Sowers' son-in-laws, John Perkins, committed suicide within the home in 1930. Um, there have also been an of, a whole other slew of deaths, natural causes within the home as well. Um, and it's just, with any family, there's bound to be strange things that happen. There's bound to be um, strange deaths, a lot of tragedy. Uh, and they had 12 kids. 12 kids. And if you branch that out and they each have at least five kids, like, holy and cow. And they tell two friends. And they, and they tell, tell two, two friends. friends. Uh, you um, can track TB by uh, air particulates, particularly from people coughing who have TB. Really? Yep. Interesting. Uh, so you're saying you can prevent TB by wearing a Wearing face a fucking mask. mask. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, even in Tombstone, Doc Holliday always had his tissue that he would cough into. So Nice. Yeah. Just kept Never it all with him. It. Never touched that tissue. <laughs> Oh, I hate that you've never seen Tombstone. Yeah, I've never seen it. Okay. So when you see stuff like that, you wonder if it's curse like, if the family was cursed somehow, because they were pretty well off. Did he sell his soul to the devil, maybe? And so bad things happened. Um I like how the last episode when I talked about these documented occurrences from these high ranking generals <laughs> of unidentified flying objects. Uh, you're like, it's the US. I'm sure the US just had a bunch of shit in the area. Time traveling US people. But when it comes to this guy, like, family did pretty well. You're like, sold is sold to the devil. Must be. Well, when bad things happen to your family, and, and now that the house is just abandoned and dilapidated, you know, maybe luck dries out. You, things happen, man. Okay? Okay. Crossroad demons and all that. Wow. Um, the house was built for about $20,000 at the time. I gotta make a connection really fast. You said crossroad demons. You know, supernatural reference, right? Yeah. What's the song that finishes every season? Uh, Carry On My Wayward Son. By Kansas. Boom. Oh, my God. There you go. All the dots are connected now. <laughs> okay. Hang on, let me put my tinfoil hat on. <laughs> okay, so the house was built around 1871 for around $20,000. $20,000 is over $420,000 today. So it's... I mean, it's a nice sized house. It's a pretty nice house, today. especially for Kansas. Like that's a lot of money being invested into a piece of property. Um this house stood on 63 acres. Holy shit. So it was a lot of land. That's it, all of Kansas. He bought Kansas. <laughs> the band? <laughs> he bought the band Kansas. Um so it was enough room for Sauer's vineyard, winery, they had a bakery on the property. Um, they had area to eat outside. He has a town. This guy had a town. Um, they, these people were some fancy peeps. Um, though the home sits practically in abandonment now, it was a pretty opulent dream when it was built. I mean, when you're putting over $400,000 into building your house, you probably couldn't build a house for $400,000 these days. But they... Oh, yeah, well, you could. It just depends on where you're at. Oh, yeah, that's true. You probably couldn't um, buy 63 acres and, no, and no, build no. a house. I think that the, the land will cost more money. Just building the house was the 20000 Oh, okay. That's yeah. interesting. Um, it had 14-foot ceilings. And 12-foot-tall windows. Such a waste. <laughs> the, the ceiling. Think of your fucking utility bill, man. You're heating <laughs> all have, that empty space. They don't have that. I mean, they don't have that. They don't have, like, the... the... He needed the 63 acres to chop down all the fucking Jesus trees in his house. <laughs> oh, my God. What? Those are really high ceilings. Um, there are marble fireplaces, and even... Uh, there's even a wine cellar underground. Um... If you had 
boatloads of money. It would be really cool to refurbish this place. Um, it's just so... You look at pictures, even the dilapidated pictures now, you can see how nice it would look if you just fixed it up. Um, and I really want someone to do it so I can see it all nice and fancy. And ugh. All right, Patreon um, goal. Once we get to a million patrons, <laughs> a million patrons. we will do that. Um, you guys can all come stay the night for free. Anyone who's a patron can come stay the night for free. Go to patreon.com. No, I'm Dude, if you. we get a million patrons... I don't think anyone has a million patrons on Patreon. Oh my so. gosh. Even if everybody just chipped in a dollar, holy crap. Yeah. I would totally redo that house. Okay. This home was one of the first in Kansas City to have running water. Wow. So these people were pretty darn fancy, pretty well off. It's definitely a luxury that I think most people take for granted nowadays. The miracle of plumbing and running water. Yeah. Um, dude, I can't even imagine just having to go into an outhouse. Ugh. Or like, oh, I'm going to take a bath. I'm going to make 17 trips to the well. Let me boil this water to make yeah. it warm. Holy shit. Um, did they used to just have fire underneath? I don't know. And just boil themselves? Well, it's like you had those big, like, ovens that were in the middle of a room. They weren't technically ovens. They were just, like, big stoves or furnaces that Uh you'd put all your fire into and the heat would radiate off of it. And then you'd put stuff on there. I know this because this is what the cabins are like in Canada. Oh, So, like, you would put all the firewood in and if it gets really cold, you burn as much firewood as you can. But then you would, like, put anything you need heated on top of it. Or, like, there was a a rack for drying your shit hung over it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if we got rained on, that's what we would do. I imagine it's similar to that. Those cabins still had running water. Oh, okay. So, like, we were able to just, like, put, like, whatever we wanted on the stove. But, like, if you did not have running water, I imagine that's what you would do to take, like, a hot bath. Interesting. The miracle of hot baths in 2020. (laughs) Okay, so... Anton supposedly chose the location for his home because it reminded him of his hometown along the Rhine River in the Swiss Alps. This guy's fancy. Um, I mean, he, he they put this house on this hill and they could see both the rivers. You could see the Kansas River and the Missouri River. That's pretty nice. It's pretty, pretty dreamy situation. Uh, even more legendary is that this dream location he chose was supposedly built on what was once a shawnee indian trail that's sad um just yet another example of a haunted house in america built on ancient ancient native american (laughs) burial ground i guess Uh, technically this isn't a burial ground it's a trail it's a trail but i'm sure people must have i mean bad things must have happened who knows apparently this was a portion that later became part of the santa fe trail uh where people kind of took their wagons out west, things like that. Um, There are legends of buried treasure on the property and bodies buried in secret tunnels that lead to the river. On the property, there have been, like, strange carved arrows that have been found that people just assume are pointing towards something, something hidden, um, but no, no treasure or anything has ever been found. Um, supposedly a man murdered his entire family within the Sour Castle and buried them in the backyard and then killed himself. But there's no documented report of that ever happening. Um, with the tunnels, it's a little difficult because the house was built on like a rock cliff. So they'd have to go through a lot of effort just to build the tunnels to the river, um, which make people believe that that's something that's not quite possible. And if they did that, then they are some sneaky fucks. (laughs) Neighbors claim to see ghostly lights in the tower and on the grounds. They hear voices coming from the home even when no one is currently living in it. People have heard laughing, crying, shouting. Typical sounds that would come from a home that's filled with a large family with a bunch of children. Or a haunted house site that a bunch of teenagers would go to typically to party at. That's true, too. Um, the Widow's Walk, which is the platform at the top of the tower. I don't know why they call it that, but I literally typed in Widow's Walk into Google and it's just like platform at the top of a whatever that has an uh, unimpeded view of whatever they want to look at. I mean, it's probably, um, it's probably associating the ominous word widow with the fact that you might die because you might fall. Maybe. Why wouldn't it be called Widow Wars? peak or something widow has a better ring to it (laughs) all right so anyway the widow's walk on the top of the tower is said to be the site of where a woman is seen pacing back and forth on it all dressed in black that's sad um 
On Halloween, a man and a woman have been seen dancing within the tower. Um, this could be just some people wanting to put a show on during Halloween or something like that, because that doesn't seem too far-fetched that people um, hear about these legends and things like that and want to do something like that. But this house in, is in such disrepair, I would be way too scared to even try dancing up in that tower. Um, doors are said to open and slam shut on their own. Objects have been said to shake violently and what screams ghosts more than the feeling of being eerily watched? Moving objects. I would say moving <laughs> objects screams ghosts a little bit more than that. I don't know. I don't like the feeling of being watched, especially if I can't see anything or, or, or if I turn around and it's like there's nothing there. But I you totally just have agree. that weird feeling. I would um, tell myself, you could like postulate that maybe someone is watching you, you know? If something moves on its own, it's not like, <laughs> maybe someone did that that I can't see. No, no, no. You got ghosts, dog. Um, I've been re-watching BuzzFeed Unsolved because I love them so much. But they go to the Queen Mary at some point. We've done an episode on the Queen Mary, if you folks haven't heard that one yet. Uh, and they have this video evidence of um, Ryan going to the Queen Mary like 10 years ago, 12 years ago or something like that. And he recorded like this plastic bag on the counter that had like toothpaste or something in it. And it looks like something crushes the bag and topples the stuff over. And I was just like, fuck that. That's super cool. Cause I know the queen Mary is one of the more, um, skeptically sought after spots because they've discovered devices that were faking things before. Oh really? Just listen to the episode dog. Yeah. Oh yeah. The what that we did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, well, even when we went to the Winchester, they have like little sound boards placed everywhere. That's kind of annoying. Yeah, the um, Winchester was more like a history tour, I feel like. The basement yeah. was supposed to be the haunted spot, and you're like, no. I don't want to waste the basement. So, <laughs> Scary. Okay. So scared. All right. <clears throat> but anyway, the quote unquote castle has been investigated on more than one occasion. In the 80s, paranormal investigators concluded that most of the haunting was based in the attic. Uh, Maurice Schwalm wrote a book called Mo Can Ghosts, probably Missouri, Kansas mixed. That makes sense. Ghosts, uh, the case book of a Kansas City psychic investigator, and reportedly took photos during his investigation of the home that showed supposed evidence of spirits. And I assume those were like orbs, things like that. Um, I don't think he actually took a picture of a person standing there, but who knows? I, uh, w if there is a photo of that, we'll try and put it on our Instagram. Proof of the afterlife. Just no one saw it. No big deal. That being said, there have been those that claim there really isn't any evidence substantial enough to believe that the home is haunted. Becky Ray of Paranormal Activity Investigators, after an in-depth investigation, came out referring to it as, quote, a beautiful empty house that seems to beg for ghost stories to be attached to it, end quote. Uh, I think that's a lot of actual, like, abandoned buildings and things like that. People are just like, well, it's abandoned and it's creepy looking. Let's make some stories. If it's empty and it's creepy, then sooner or later someone's going to attach a story to it, regardless of if it has any factual evidence to go with it. Sowers lived within the home for five generations until the death of Eve Maria Sauer in 1955, after which they sold it to the next owner, Paul Barry, which I think is just such a cute name. Um, <laughs> this not meant to be condescending at all. If you're named Paul Barry now, your name is You think awesome. it's cute because of its? it sounds like Mary Barry yes! and she's the most adorable lady ever. But there's also Paul Hollywood. It's a mix of the two. Oh, that's adorable. Um, Barry lived in only a small section of the house. He didn't use the rest of the house. He lived in a small section of the house and fought off vandals, thieves, and curious onlookers for 30 years. Um, and those were probably kids that were like, yo, let's check out this haunted house. Um, which is probably kind of like what you used to do where you, people were like, hey, there's a haunted house. Let's go check it out. Um, I know you've come across the person who's like, with I a live shotgun. here. Like, yeah. Fuck off. Yeah. Um, it's said that he protected the property with his three-legged German Shepherd Aww. and a shotgun full of rock salt. Was the dog named Tripod? That would be a cute name for a dog. It's like the best name for a three-legged dog. Um, but what's curious to me is the fact that he had a shotgun full of rock salt. 
Who does that? Someone who doesn't want to actually kill whoever they're like, oh, aiming gotcha. their gun at. Okay. Or someone who's hunting. Go, 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 go. I was going to say Sam and Dean. <laughs> yeah. Um, Barry died in 1985, and the house was left empty for just a couple of years. In 1987, Cindy Jones, her husband and father-in-law, owned the place for a fairly brief amount of time. And while they did, they reported hearing strange, unexplained noises coming from the attic. They also witnessed the fireplace covers shaking on their own, and weird kind of coincidences kept just happening around the house. Um, They even claimed to have seen the apparition of a woman and a young boy within the home. They kept seeing this young boy in what they assumed were like his favorite places to play, Um, which is probably why they only owned the house for such a short amount of time. Because in 1988, Carl Lopp, who's actually a descendant of Anton Sauer, bought it. And he bought it with the hopes of kind of like restoring it. He didn't, unfortunately. Um, And he stated that, quote, there are no ghosts and no evil spirits inhabiting the castle or the property, end quote. And I feel like as someone who wants to refurbish the place and maybe sell it someday, he'd want to tell people that there aren't ghosts. Right. I think like back in the 80s, it was like during satanic panic and anything associated with like the occult or anything creepy would be looked at unfavorably and realistically bring the property value and the likelihood that it would sell down. Yeah. So it's not like today where it's like you say something is haunted, you put it on eBay and it sells for 10 times what it's (laughs) worth. Okay. But it could also be that because he has the blood of the original family, maybe it doesn't affect him the same. I hate hate your suppositions (laughs) when it's your topic. Like, I just watched the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like, remake or sequel. Um, I I feel like I just watched it last week or something like that. And spoilers, it's kind of old if you haven't seen it already. Um, The main character is related to the killer from the first movie. And he doesn't kill her because they're related. Maybe it's like that kind of thing. You know, the ghosts are like, oh, hey, bro, we're related. What up? Um, I hate you so much right now. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> I'm so happy you have to sit through another one of my bullshit short stories after this. Uh, either way, he was an absentee owner, which is probably why he didn't believe in the ghosts or the fact that it was haunted anyway, because he was never there. And he kind of let the place just fall into further disrepair. The roof started to leak. The windows were broken. Apparently, um, historical societies offered to fix it up or buy it, but he just refused to sell it. And from what I've read, he didn't even allow anyone within the home. This guy is just like, I just want to keep it there to keep it there. Sounds like Hill House. Oh, shit. Yeah. It's like, no, don't come anywhere near it. Oh, man. Wow. All the ghosts are still there. There you go. Uh, It was placed in the Register of Historic Kansas Places and even in the National Register of Historic Places in 1977. uh, 41 acres of the property have been set for redevelopment. Um, Of the original 63 acres, only four of the acres remain today. Four acres is still a lot of property. However, that does suck. It sucks. Um, In 1996, the quote-unquote caretaker was charged with stealing $30,000 worth of things from inside the home, including crystal chandeliers. He took, like, wall sconces. He, um, I don't know if it's a he, they stripped the copper off of um, cables and stuff like that. It was just, that's insane. Um, He's just robbing the place blind. Yeah. The house was labeled unfit for habitation and Lop was charged with a bunch of violations. Um, he had back taxes and a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, he was arrested in 1997. He messed around with legal for 20 years. Like they would um, get him for back taxes. And then at the very last second when they're going to take the house and try to sell it to someone else, he'd pay the taxes. And he would do that for years um, it apparently was up for auction this year, but was postponed due to COVID. Patron goal, people, um, <laughs> let's do this. Um, from one article that I read, the amount of back taxes is like $7,700. We can do that. We got this. <laughs> um, 
So if you want to try and buy it, I'm sure you could try and buy it. Uh, no one lives there and no one's lived there for decades. Um, these days, there's a big chain link fence around the property, similar to what you'd see if you wanted to visit the American Horror Story house. Uh, That's in exactly California. what I pictured, actually. Yeah, was it's just by like that. that. Unfo- uh, well, that house actually has people in it. But unfortunately, it looks like the house just keeps deteriorating and keeps kind of falling apart. And neighbors worry that it might get lost to time and this historic piece of Kansas City is just going to be gone forever. Um, and the longer that time goes on, the more they're freaking out because it just keeps like getting worse and worse and worse. And I really want somebody to go in and just like uh, Fix Chip and Joanna Gaines, just get wow. in there, and just do it. It's funny. I will say it sounds like the house has good bones, so uh, maybe it'll be okay, and eventually someone will get it. And uh, yeah, I would. This is what I would do realistically, uh, if I had the money and the opportunity to do it, I would buy the fucking house. <laughs> okay. I would record everything. I would do the renovations and document all the hauntings. I would live stream constantly. <laughs> I would have like a bunch of channels for people to go and check everything out. Like I would live under observation so people could see and hear all the creepy shit that would happen. It would basically would be like Big Brother meets Haunting of Hill Brother. House meets like Property <laughs> Brothers. So Big Property Brothers <laughs> is what I would call it. Oh my the god. The Haunting of Big Property Brothers. There you go. Um but yeah, that'd be awesome, but who knows? what'll happen with it and it'll be nice uh, if we can revisit this down the road and find out someone built it and might be restoring it so yeah that'd be really cool good topic robin good Thanks. jab so before i move on to my topic we're going to take a really quick commercial break and we are back so welcome to this episode of big property products thank you so much <laughs> So this week, I was actually pretty happy to be in the midst of extraterrestrial October. There does seem to be quite a bit going on. There's been so much news coming out by way of extraterrestrial things, whether it be UFO activity here on our planet or potential life on another planet. I mentioned it last week in passing, but there has been a lot of buzz about Venus and the phosphine gas observed in its atmosphere. As I mentioned, scientists went back and checked their records and realized they had actually observed the phosphine gas dating all the way back into the 70s. So it's something that shows that this could have been around. Uh, so it's really, really exciting. And scientists have actually been looking for this particular gas as a telltale sign of possible life on planets and moons. We've actually been looking for this in the atmospheres of planets and uh, other moons in other solar systems Do that we, are around other stars. Is that a gas that we have here? Is that why? And it's produced by bacteria and other forms of life. They're not exactly sure how it's produced, but they know it's a telltale sign that wouldn't be produced uh, typically in just a rare, uh, typically in a natural form, unless it was from some form of life. All right. That's not to say it can't be, but without studying Venus, we won't know. Very exciting shit. And you look for these things because we're li- we're basically looking for an atmosphere that can sustain life, which means it could potentially be studied, and I'm sure eventually terraform to become Earth 2 when we decide to abandon this planet once we've like, officially <laughs> trashed it. And it's super exciting stuff. It's historical. It's very exciting to watch and read. And it really made me wonder about Venus itself. I started thinking more and more, like, what do I even know about Venus? I know it has gas, but is it all gas? I know its atmosphere is tons of poisonous gas, but does it, like, have a surface you can walk on? Or is it just a ball of gas? You know what I mean? Yeah. So the more I was thinking about it, I was like, let's just go look it up. Turns out it does have a surface. This is actually from NASA.gov, and you can look this up if you want. Quote, the surface of Venus is not where you'd like to be with temperatures that can melt lead, an atmosphere so thick it would crush you, and clouds of sulfuric acid that smell like rotten eggs to top it off. This is not real. This is 100% from NASA.gov. I love that of the list, usually lists crescendo at the end, and it's like, yeah, the atmosphere will crush you. It's so fucking hot you'll literally melt. And it smells like eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, fuck you, NASA. They go on to say, <laughs> the atmosphere of Venus is made up mainly of carbon dioxide and thick clouds of sulfuric acid completely cover the planet. The atmosphere traps the small amount of energy from the sun that does reach the surface along with the heat of the planet itself. There you go. So it's a really hot place. Very, very fucking thick. Probably couldn't even walk through it. But it really begs the question of, what could possibly live on a planet like that that would be emitting this gas, you know? It's probably not something like us. A lot of times when you theorize that we're going to meet alien life 
or discover alien life, you imagine it'll look similar to us. You know, bipedal, maybe no mouth, but it talks like with its brain, fancy shit like that. <laughs> yeah. But who knows? Like, it doesn't sound like that would be the case when it comes to something like Venus. Well, what if something that develops on another planet that grows under different circumstances, different gases, different materials, eat different things, they just develop different skills and powers and just different, you know... They'd be way higher in charisma than we are, but we'd be way (laughs) higher in intellect. I don't know. That's why I can't wait for us to explore Venus some more. The thought has been entering my head very often, though, especially as I drift to sleep of what is on Venus. This is where the story goes. I don't know what you're talking about. But yeah, a lot of times when it's sleepy time, Betty by time, uh, I started thinking about this. And just last night, the oddest thing happened. Tell me what happened. As I drifted into sweet sweet unconsciousness my head movies started to play god <laughs> like, you couldn't just call them dreams that's my favorite way to describe dreams is head movies oh my god i was standing at the end of my driveway from when i was a kid waiting for the school bus to pick me up was it shawnee no it wasn't shawnee <laughs> this is actually division so uh, i grew up in the country we lived on half an acre of land and behind us where our property line ended was a cornfield this is totally true um, so it was, it was basically the middle of nowhere, and we had a 100-foot-long driveway. I remember that was the length of our driveway, because when we had it installed, we are like, that's how long the driveway's going to be. Okay. So in the morning, I would grab my stuff, grab my backpack, and go walk to the mailbox, and I would stand by the end of the road really? and wait for the bus to come. And, like, Division was a two-lane road. You know, one lane goes one way, one lane goes the other way, but it was very, very busy. I think the speed limit was, like, 55. Like, the speed limit you'd expect to see on, like, a much wider fucking road, but we lived in the middle of nowhere. And the bus would come over the hill, like further down, like half a mile down the road. And I could see it crescendo one hill, then dip down and go underneath my line of sight, and then come up over another hill again, and then it'd be by my house. And that's, that's when I cool. So you could see it, like say you forgot your lunch, your lunch money, and you saw the bus like come up over one hill. There was like two houses it had to pick up at before it got to mine. So I'd be like, shit, and so, just run inside and grab whatever you forgot. Me growing up was a little different when it came to bus stops. So they stopped at everybody's house? If they are picking you up to take you to school, yes. They wouldn't stop and be like, do you have children going to school? Well, when I lived in Texas and they picked us up for school, everyone had to meet in one spot. It just depends. Like if you were in a subdivision, yeah, that's what you did. But I lived in the middle of nowhere. So they stopped at houses because it was like, that's the only place you could stop. Like, your parents aren't going to, like, drive you to a pickup. They're going to do that. They might as well just drive you to school. So in in the middle of nowhere, I was about to say boondies. And I was like, is it boondies or boonies? God damn it, Dad. I don't fucking remember. <laughs> so in the middle of nowhere, that's how they did pickups. Okay? So you just stand there and wait. And this is the dream. And I'm standing there and waiting. And some days there's nothing but the birds to keep you company in the morning. Now, back in the Midwest, we have these things called fog days or fog delays, depending on how bad the fog is. And for folks who have never experienced one, it's where the moisture on the foliage or the bodies of water themselves have a temperature that is higher than the air. The air is cold. The water is warm. All right. And the warm, moist air above or around the water cools rapidly and as it does its humidity percentage of that air hits 100 percent when that happens you get fog that's where fog comes from this happens quite frequently especially in the midwest but when everything is dewy and your area has a lot of bodies of water you can get quite a bit of fog it was not abnormal for that to happen to me and then in my dream it kind of starts to happen i remember sometimes i'd be walking out to go to the, the mailbox and I couldn't even see it from 100 feet away. That's how thick the fog wow. was. Sometimes I couldn't see the end of the fence, which was like 20 feet. That is like living in a cloud, you know? And sometimes when you're in a dream, you have that happen to you. You know, you can't really see around you. It's just like eerily misty and you don't know why. And as I'm standing there at the mailbox, all this fog starts to roll in. And I get really nervous. I realize I can't see down the street to the hill to see the bus come over. it. I'm not going to be able to see the bus. So I look back at the house. I can't even see my house. I'm just standing by this mailbox with the road I'm supposed to be getting on the bus at and my driveway. And that's all I can see. And I start to get real, real creeped out. And then I realize as I start to move back towards the house that I can't move. This fog is so thick. Just trying to start back towards the house is like walking through a crowd of people that are shoulder to shoulder and everyone's refusing to move. It's like I'm trapped. And then I feel it. And it's eerie because you talked about this earlier tonight. I feel like I'm being watched. Like there's eyes looking at me. Is it the bus? 
I don't know who or what it is, but I feel this. And I start scanning the field of vision that I can actually see being trapped where I am. And then I breathe a sigh of relief when I spot something. I spot the headlights of the school bus in the distance. And they must be really bright because the fog tends to obscure lights. That's why you have fog lights. But I can see these two dots in the distance that are shining bright that are letting me know something's coming this way. Someone will be near me soon and I won't be alone. And hopefully they'll help me get on the bus because I can't move. But the headlights aren't getting closer. They're staying in the same spot. Maybe they're picking up someone else. But they're, they're kind of close, so it doesn't make sense. And they're bright, and they're cutting through the fog, and they feel like hope. And then they narrow and go out for a moment. And then they reopen, and they're bright again. And that's when I realize it. Those lights didn't go out. They just blinked. Ooh, that's creepy. Those aren't lights. Those are eyes. That is what is looking at me. And it occurs to me, this thing is a lot closer than I am comfortable with. And suddenly I hear this noise... Like a cross between a whale song and a husky arguing with a human over some food it stole. What's that sound like? It sounds like Snowball. From it does. Rick I and totally Morty. nailed Snowball from Rick and Morty. <laughs> but I'm scared and curious at the same time. I see the silhouette of this creature. I know it's not a bus now. And it's towering. It's several stories tall. It has this long neck like a giraffe. And my mind knows it's not a giraffe, and a word hits my mind, and I can't even quite grasp what it is, but it's plesiosaur. And I'm like, I know what that means when I'm awake, but I don't know what it means when I'm sleeping. Nessie. And these eyes are burning bright, and I hear this deep voice boom in my head, and it says, tell them about me. <laughs> and then suddenly the, the fog begins to fade, and I can move again. And I realize when the voice spoke... I closed my eyes. The presence of the voice was so powerful it made me close my eyes. And as I begin to shift in place and test my mobility, my eyes open. And I'm at the podium in my speech class in nothing but underwear. And everyone is staring at me and laughing. (laughs) I used to have that dream a lot. I was always in tidy whities I don't know why and I never wore tidy whities And suddenly I wished... I was surrounded by that suffocating fog. I've never had the dr- the like the na- naked dream in front of everyone. I've never. I've had never that. been naked, but I've always been in tidy whities and I've been embarrassed. I'm like, I don't wear these. I don't know why I'm in these. That's the last thing I remember about my dream, which was much more haunting than the rest of the dream. But now you all know my visit, my vision from the Loch Venus monster. Oh my! I really thought you'd appreciate that pun. <laughs> It's awful. I did mention... You thought all my football team names today were awful? That was awful. She has to change her team name because her fucking team name of Dak Dad Ass Up Into My Chub is now named after one person who's not coming back and one person who's out for six weeks. So it's like, who are you going to curse this time, Robin? I'm also 5-0. She is 5-0, shockingly. I'm the only one in the league that is undefeated. And I have changed my team name. It's Gold for the Gold. For Robbie Gold, her kicker. Yeah. <laughs> Getting back to this, I totally mentioned to Robin this past weekend about how much I hope the potential life on Venus was actually a kaiju. And I'm holding on to that and I'm hoping for a giant Loch Ness monster. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to go with. And as fun as this Venus update was and this ridiculous short story, which you folks asked me to bring back, I remind you, it's not my topic. My topic is, of course, the O'Hare Airport Whoa, UFO. Oh my God! You of went 2006. <laughs> you went through all of that, and Venus isn't even in your topic. The vision was too powerful. Okay. Oh I my had sweet jeez. Okay. So let's get into this, and I will say <laughs> the actual topic. If anyone's annoyed with that story, is like, oh my God, just get to it. It was worth the wait because this topic is pretty fucking sweet. So first and foremost, take the things discussed. In this episode with a grain of salt, we are talking about unidentified flying objects. However, that does not mean extraterrestrial all the time. I know this is extraterrestrial October, but this definitely is talking about an object that was there that no one knows what it was. And a lot of people theorize it has to be alien life because we don't have anything like that here. So grain of salt, but keep an open mind. Although there is some official word from agencies involved in this particular story, it never hurts to have a healthy dose of skepticism. I would apply that not only to the events that occurred, but to the agencies that involve, that are involved in this story. So, that's out of the way. O'Hare Airport UFO of 2006 took place at O'Hare Airport in 2006. That's a joke. For those of you who don't know, O'Hare is one of Chicago's two major airports. The largest one. Uh, the other airport being Midway. I've flown in and out of both a ton in my yeah, life. Yeah, even I've gone in and out. Oh my gosh. 
Na 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 hey. Uh, I don't know why a, it's stuck in my he's head. He's just obsessed with dynamite right God now. Damn you, BTS! I don't have a favorite to be clear. O'Hare, Midway, it doesn't really matter to me. Midway is easier for people back home to get to to pick me up. It's further south than O'Hare. That's the only thing that would make me fly to O'Hare. We fly American Airlines, which only goes out of Southwest or only goes out of O'Hare. Yeah, Southwest goes to Midway. Yeah. pretty sure. These are irrelevant details. <laughs> The incident in question takes place on November 7th, 2006. Those details aren't irrelevant. I want you to know I'm very familiar with this place. Okay. That said, y'all remember 2006, right? I'm going to go through some events. I'm not going to do the normal thing I do because a lot of shit happened in 2006. And it was only 14 years ago. And I can't believe it was 14 years ago. As a junior in high school. 2006, Google bought YouTube. The Wii came out. Pluto lost its planet status. Wah, wah. Uh, Cheney shot a dude in the face, quote unquote, on I accident. I remember that. The movie Borat came out. Yes, that's right. Borat was 14 years ago. Steve Irwin died. R.I.P. And most importantly, My Chemical Romance is the Black Parade came out eight days before Robin's 17th birthday. Shut up. <laughs> it totally did. October 23rd. Another thing that was happening, which totally clicked in my mind, was that smoking indoors was being banned in workplaces, restaurants, bars, etc. And it reminded me of how I used to hear this lecture 14 years ago on how secondhand smoke doesn't actually harm anyone and how the smoke coming off the tip of a cigarette actually has nothing wrong with it and is completely harmless. It's when you inhale it through the filter that something happens to you. And I heard this every fucking weekend as more and more restaurants and bars stop letting us go in there and stop letting people that i knew smoke i never smoked back then that's a lie i smoked their cigarettes all the time what 14 years later it seems weird that this was an argument you know what i mean like nowadays it's just unfathomable to think that you could go into like a restaurant like applebee's and they ask you smoking or non-smoking you know Pretty now it's just you don't smoke. You don't smoke you don't in smoke there. It. You want to smoke, yeah. you go outside, and now you have designated areas to smoke. That's just how it works because you don't want to endanger someone else's health with your choice or your decision. And the fact that that happened 14 years ago, and I can't even remember those arguments until I had this like recovery moment, kind of blew my mind. But there's always these sorts of arguments going on in our society. It used to happen with seatbelts, too. People used to argue that seatbelts would kill more people than they would save when they first came out. Except that not wearing your seatbelt was a personal choice that wouldn't cause someone else to die unless you got, like, launched out of your car like a missile and you somehow hit another person. Now you can't drive without your car yelling at you. Yeah, the car's like, put on on. your seatbelt. I used to not drive with a seatbelt at all. um, because Cars don't actually yell that. They're like, ding, No, they beep at you and it's really annoying. But I remember not driving with a seatbelt. My parents, growing up, my parents never wore their seatbelt. Always a controversial issue out there that people just don't want to do because it's like, you're affecting my personal choice and it makes me mad. Not drawing parallels to anything, but I'm obviously drawing parallels to now. Anyways, November 7, 2006, folks at O'Hare Airport, whether it be employee or traveler, would have a bizarre experience. And not all folks would have this because, in particular, the folks in Concourse C would have the perfect angle to see something perhaps... Out of this world. Concourse C, something out of this world. Hate you so much. (laughs) Concourse C happens to be where the United Terminal is located. That's right, United, the people who beat up passengers and drag them off the plane. Oh my god. Remember when that was the big issue? I remember, yeah. And then we flew United after that, and we almost died landing at O'Hare Airport. Cheap tickets. (laughs) Which I'm going to head and get to in a bit because it totally plays into why we almost died. What? Why this thing was so special, okay? So, Concourse C, United Terminal, United Pilots, Maintenance Workers, Management Personnel would join travelers in their reports of what is about to unfold. At around 4.15 p.m., a ramp worker for United would notice an object in the sky that seemed to be just floating stationary. Which is, for the most part, pretty out of the ordinary for an airport. It's very monitored and restricted airspace. Hovering helicopters are typically not allowed in any way, shape, or form unless that airspace has been completely shut down. Planes are flying in and out. You've got to keep the area clear. This particular ramp worker was pushing back United Airline Flight 446 per records kept in accordance to policy when an incident is reported. Flight 446 was to depart from Chicago and head for Charlotte, North Carolina. Nothing happened to this flight. I just want to show you I did my fucking research. Wow. There was a dark gray saucer-shaped object not appearing to be any aircraft bound for or departing from O'Hare Airport 
just hanging in the fucking sky. The object was hovering over gate C-17. Now, being from the Chicagoland area and having been here a lot, one thing to note about O'Hare that almost caused us to die is that, especially around November, that area is almost constantly overcast. Yeah. Cloud cover constantly, okay? And just a cloud cover needing to be punched through during landing will make every trip home this wonderful life or death experience because you don't see shit until it's like, oh, there's the runway. Yeah. Yeah, so, it's, it's just you, you don't know how far the ground is. You're looking out the window just waiting to see the city, waiting to see the city. And then, like, when we were flying, we came out and it was just like, oh, that's the fucking airport. That's the ground. And all of a sudden, crank the throttle up and we're going back in the sky yeah. so you don't die. It was And it was crazy. terrifying. So they have this thing that they let pilots know, everyone's aware of this, that need to know, called the cloud deck. It lets you know basically where the bottom of the clouds are. This is where that you're gonna, sounds like a Magic the Gathering thing. Right? It's where you're going to come out and cast pacifism on everything because white decks suck. Anyways, oh my God. the cloud deck on this particular day was 1,900 feet. So not very far off the ground at all, but far enough where you're not going to experience the terrifying reality of you might almost die like Robin and I did. Although the ramp worker's sighting of this craft is credited as the first, many, many more folks would come pouring in as time rolled on, and it is a very short amount of time. For those curious about the fact that it gets dark quite early in November in Chicago, because you just ended up finishing daylight savings time and rolled back, you know, fall back. Yeah. Daylight lasted until 6.13 p.m. That is when sunset began. I've checked the charts. I did my research. So the illuminated cloud cover made a solid backdrop for this dark object that just floated and, according to all witnesses on the ground, produced no sound whatsoever. In addition, it also showed no visible signs of propulsion or any type of force that would keep it aloft. No one knew how it was floating there. And these people that are looking at it are pilots at this point. Eyewitness accounts do differ from some folks stating the object seemed to be spinning in place like a plate on a stick, while others say it was just floating stationary. What is very interesting is that the object was not observed from anyone in the tower as it was not showing on the radar. This object existed, it was floating, and no one had any idea in the tower because it was undetectable by radar. That's crazy. Total of 12 United Airlines employees filed official reports regarding the sighting along with an undisclosed amount of travelers in the airport and a witness who was outside the airport that had arrived earlier that day. The sighting lasted for a total of five minutes. They, so they all were just looking at this thing for five minutes. Exactly. Well, not all of them. So basically what happened was a dude was outside and he saw this thing in the sky and he got on his radio and was like, yo, dogs, like, is anyone else seeing this shit above C-17 right now? And people heard and started to check it out. And the more people were talking about it, like, yeah, I see it, more and more people went to check it out. And as folks checked and started to speculate on what it was and noticed the oddity of the shape and the fact that it was hovering other people went to look at it a lot of these folks were pilots because they wanted to know what craft it could be every pilot they interviewed almost all of them anonymously stated there is no one it existed and two it is not anything that exists that is made by human beings they were adamant about this wow so they were not fucking around these are like professional people who fly in the sky most of which are ex-military according to the records i found so Here's the thing. It's easy to just say, oh, these people are full of shit and write it off. But nearly all witnesses remained anonymous when speaking to the press, as they were told by their employer to employer to put it bluntly, to keep their fucking mouth shut. And here's where the incident gets even more interesting. The craft was not seen on the radar, like I mentioned. The witnesses that were late to the party also didn't see it. You know, you show up, it lasted there for five minutes, it's not there anymore, so you're like, ah, you know, maybe they're lying. It's the U.S. government paying off the airport and the airlines to they don't keep their mouth pay shut. Pay anyone to keep their mouth shut? They're like, we'll destroy you unless you keep your mouth shut. So you're saying it is the U.S. government? We're gonna get there. The amount of witnesses lead to the folks that didn't see it agreeing there must have been something there. These people wouldn't just spontaneously lie, you know. Plus, what was there that everyone could see was a hole punched in the clouds where the craft had departed. Wow. So this thing floated for five minutes and took off at incredible speed upwards. But you, And you just saw that, what, like a circle in the clouds? Yeah, or, okay. it created a hole punch in the clouds. And this is a thing. So I'm going to post a picture on Instagram slash Facebook that shows how aircraft can make holes in cloud cover. 
Not all do. It doesn't happen all the time, but it is common enough where it is a known occurrence. It's not necessarily avoidable if the conditions are correct, particularly if this aircraft is traveling at a high speed. The people who would go on to dispute this incident had to do so and explain that the hole punch in the clouds was there. Even the people that say, like, this is total horseshit, there was no UFO, they acknowledge there was a hole punch in the clouds. Okay. So that makes it much more difficult to be skeptical on this one. This incident was spoken of around town, around Chicago, around O'Hare, and when the article came out regarding this on the Chicago Tribune's website, in 24 hours, it immediately became their highest traffic article to that point. Wow. No article put online for the Chicago Tribune had had as much traffic as this article did in 24 hours. The FAA, which stands for the Federal Aviation Administration, became involved due to the nature of the sighting, but decided it would not investigate the incident because the object didn't appear on the radar. Therefore, it it must not have been there. The FAA would take the stories of the witnesses into account and label the incident a, quote, weather phenomenon. Basically, what they said was, something happened with the clouds. That's why the cloud hole was there. Something happened. We don't know what. The official statement from the FAA came after the Chicago Tribune dug up their ass for an answer. That official statement was, quote, Our theory on this is that it was a weather phenomenon. That night was a perfect atmospheric condition in terms of low cloud ceiling and a lot of airport lights. When the lights shine up into the cloud, sometimes you can see funny things. That's our take on it, end quote. So all the people crappy answer that said that there was a saucer there and it took off. They just discounted literally everything and said, like, it was the lights reflecting off of the off the clouds. These are fucking pilots. These are people who are at the airport all the time. If you're just discounting the passengers and the witnesses outside of O'Hare Airport, that they're just saying they don't know what they saw. We didn't see it. We saw the hole. They must be wrong. So here's the thing. When the story got a ton of press and a ton of attention internationally, The Chicago Tribune reached out for comment on whether or not anything was being done on the matter. Okay, United replied to them and said they didn't even have a report on the incident from anyone involved and the officials did not recall discussion of any such incident. So they went on to say, like, all those employees that you're speaking to anonymously, they never filed a report. We don't know anything about it. We've never had a discussion on this whatsoever. Sounds like a cover-up. Here's a quote from the Chicago Tribune. There's nothing in the duty manager log which is used to report unusual incidents, said United spokeswoman Megan McCarthy. I checked around. There's no record of anything. So it doesn't exist. It's all made up. The FAA stated nothing was being done. It's weather phenomenon. And they had no information on the sighting at all. Now here's where things get really, really juicy. Have you ever caught someone in a lie before? Uh, Has someone ever been lying to you? My and mom's you, caught me in a life. You realize that's so funny you say that because I said I'm sure the parents out there have caught their kids red-handed before. Oh, you know, yeah. have you ever had someone tell you one thing, and then when you present them with evidence, they were lying. They changed their story just enough to explain why they lied, but still hang on to the bullshit conclusion they gave you. It's infuriating. Like just fess up. You're caught. Now in my case. If I lied to my parents, I had the fear of God put into me at a young age that they would beat the tan off my ass unless I told them the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I mean, your ass is pretty pale, so it's not that hard. That's very mean. Shows you that I must have lied when I was a kid. (laughs) Grown-ups, when they're caught, aren't always like that, which sucks. But every now and then, you can catch a grown-up in a lie, and you can prove that someone is fucking lying to you. And as upset as you might be, that feeling of like, I got you now, you son of a bitch. It's almost satisfying enough that you're happy they fucked around with you. And now they're about to find out. So anonymous folks from United approached the Tribune and told them that one, their identities better not come out. And two, they were approached by officials at United and were told to write down what they saw and draw what they saw and to keep their mouth shut about it going forward. The pilots of the aircraft that were at gate C-17 stated they were told by United personnel of the object and they opened their windscreen on their aircraft to observe what was above them. So that's how they found out about it was they were told by United personnel who are now claiming they never had any discussion on this whatsoever. Sources presenting this much information was a clear sign to the folks at the Chicago Tribune that there may 
have been a way to find out if they were being lied to or not. Enter the Freedom of Information Act, the FOIA, or FOIA for short. FOIA. The FOIA was brought into existence in 1967 and more or less grants rights to the public to request access to any records from any federal agency, like the Federal Aviation Administration, perhaps. And you can always get denied access to whatever you request, but it's primarily based off if that requested information has a level of classification that's not available to the public. So to summarize what happened, here's how this broke down. The Chicago Tribune reached out to the FAA. The FAA said, that thing, it was weird weather. We don't have anything else on it. Then the Chicago Tribune said, all right, and filled out an official FOI request. (laughs) It was received by the FOI, and the Chicago (laughs) Tribune was granted access to tapes of a United Supervisor calling the FAA manager in the fucking O'Hare Airport Tower during the incident to report the object that they were seeing. So they were caught, hand in the cookie jar. Here's the tapes of you motherfuckers lying to us, like United and the FAA. Liar, liar, pants on fire. So the FAA backtracked and said, all right, you got us, you got the tapes, we did know about it. Despite that, They still stuck with their explanation. This time, the language they used was changed to, quote, the weather might have factored into what the witnesses thought they saw. It's such a fuck you to everyone involved in this, even though they're caught, man. In fact, the earlier statement from the official stating this was a weather phenomenon is actually from after they were caught lying about it. Wow. They were sticking with it to the fucking end. United never issued a statement correcting their nonsense. They were caught, they were lying, and they kept their mouth shut. Whatever reports they were whatever reports were filed are under lock and key at United and they just moved on with their lives. As far as their employees that did decide to speak out when this all happened, here's an account on the incident that I found particularly interesting. This is from a mechanic who was actually in the cockpit of a Boeing 777 that was taxiing to the maintenance hangar at the time in the sea concourse area. He stated, quote, I tend to be scientific by nature, and I do not understand why aliens would hover over a busy airport. But I know that what I saw and what a lot of other people saw stood out very clearly, and it is definitely not an Earth aircraft, end quote. Straight up, I don't buy shit. I know what I saw. That's not something that's on this planet. What if it was just government testing technology and seeing if the tower could see it? Why would you why would you come out of the cloud cover for that? Testing it. Why would you expose it to the people below when you could just sit in the cloud cover and see if it showed up on the radar? And that's it. That's all you got to do. You're testing it. Okay, so, you're testing it. You don't need to come out of the cloud cover. What if it's an accident cuz you aren't you're testing it. So it's just it's still just like a test. So you didn't notice you came out of the cloud what cover. What if you couldn't control it and it accidentally went out of the cloud cover? So you're saying these things have existed since the 40s and 50s, but someone didn't know the up and down switch correctly or it was malfunctioning. Yeah, what if it was malfunctioning? What if it, it, they're still trying to perfect it? You're making a lot of bullshit excuses if, right now. Okay, so what if you have to control it? Like, um, what are the, those ships? Like, like the in, It Machine from that episode of South Park where it puts a probe in your anus no, in your No, like in Captain Marvel, how you have to control that oh thing, right? Oh my god, right? I hate you so much. <laughs> and you just, you're not exactly sure how to control it, you know? I'm gonna keep and, going now. Okay. <laughs> so there's an organization known as NARCAP. N-A-R-C-A-P. The National Aviation Reporting Center on Anomalous Phenomenon. Fully accredited staff with professionals, really? nonprofit 100%. It exists. They investigate incidents that occur involving unidentified aerial phenomenon, not necessarily UFOs, strange shit in the sky that may pose possible safety issues to aircraft or personnel involved. Mainly because when things like this happen, statements get taken, everyone fucking ignores it, and no one considers the fact that if it's something natural that we don't know about, it could cause serious issues like for instance, downdrafts or microbursts that were thought to be myths for a long time and were literally crashing fucking commercial airliners when they were flown through. NARCAP is a group of individuals. It's an organization that's dedicated to making sure anything that's happening that is a threat or a potential threat is investigated properly. All right. They had an unidentified flying object hanging outside the gate at O'Hare airport during peak traffic time. And that definitely qualifies. And the FAA didn't investigate it literally at all. 
So NARCAP spoke to the witnesses that were included in this report, and they uncovered, not uncovered, but they reviewed the uncovered evidence from the FOIA request. They published a report that is 128 pages long on the incident, although Wikipedia claims it's 155. It's 128. I found the actual report. It is shocking how much eyewitness evidence was absolutely ignored by the FAA, as well as scientific evidence to determine what caused the hole punch in the sky that existed and how they could have narrowed these things down. They literally ignored all of this. So the conclusion that's summarized on Wikipedia on this particular incident is this, quote, Anytime an airborne object can hover for several minutes over a busy airport, but not be registered on radar or seen visually from the control tower, constitutes a potential threat to flight safety. Needs to be investigated. Something dangerous happened, you know? Yeah. The conclusion that I'm pulling from the conclusion section of this report is a bit more dry and sciencey, but in my honest opinion... Uh, it's much more impactful. Now, I'm leaving out the calculation conclusions and the tables and the graphs because none of us can process what 9.4 kilojoules per meter cubed in the form of heat is in scale. But the conclusion does let us know, based off of those results they took, what this means. All right. Quote, we postulate that the instantaneous nature of the HIC formation, HIC is hole in cloud, the circular shape. And its sharp edges all point to the direct emission of, for example, electromagnetic radiation from the surface of the oblate spheroid as the proximate case of the hole in cloud. That's saying that whatever traveled through is what made the hole in the cloud. It goes on. We cannot identify the object or the phenomenon lying inside the oblate spheroid surface. So they don't know what the fucking object is. And that's not what they're trying to determine. They're just trying to determine if it existed. But two conclusions seem inescapable. One, the object or phenomenon observed would have had to have been something objectively and externally real to create the HIC effect so it didn't just fucking come out of nowhere. And two, the HIC phenomenon associated with this object cannot be explained by either conventional weather phenomena or conventional airspace craft whether acknowledged or unacknowledged. It's literally saying that nothing we have or nothing we've ever observed in nature or constructed that's man-made could cause what happened. And they have a 128-page paper on the science of this, and the calculations blew my mind. It was like looking at the report that you were working on earlier if the data would have been filled out properly by your lab partner. It was mind-blowing how (laughs) in-depth this report was. I seriously doubt they do. (laughs) So I'm just saying... Professionals in aviation reviewed this and filed a report stating that there was negligence by not investigating this because whatever object was there and was clearly there based off the evidence poses a risk to any of the surrounding aircraft. Period. That's just how it is. Something was there. Something punched a damn hole in the sky when it left. And the FAA and United lied about it. And when they got caught and they got pointed out that they were lying, they simultaneously admitted they lied and stuck with their lie. And I think when shit like this happens, lying and ignoring people that know you're lying is the worst thing that you could do. Coming out and saying something like, quote, there's a wayward craft during a routine training exercise. would let folks know, this is ours, don't freak out, sorry about that, you know? If you have experimental aircraft that you're working on, just use the old training exercise excuse. Just go with it. It's like, uh, it wasn't a saucer, it was just a normal plane. People would be like, oh, okay, cool. You know, they could even say something like it was a fucking helicopter. That's why it was floating. People were like, it didn't look like a helicopter. It's like, what else could it be? They could say something like the phenomenon witnessed at O'Hare on November 7, 2006 is believed to be explainable in origin, but all witness accounts are going to be considered while we continue this ongoing investigation. How fucking hard would that be to let folks know you're going to be reasonable and you're skeptic, but responsible? No. It's literally, there was nothing there. There was a hole in the clouds. We don't know what made it. But it was like weather time and there was shiny lights, so all those people are stupid. Shine bright like a diamond. Saying it's nothing, literally, no one saw anything. We haven't heard anything, nothing to see here, folks. Then getting caught and saying, oh, well, yeah, we lied and we totes knew about it. We still think everyone's full of shit and the cloud punched a hole in itself. Weird. Anyways, uh, I think I hear my mom calling me, bye. (laughs) Just shows you're a disdainful prick. There's no respect at all for anyone involved. And now the most frustrating part that I waited to get to till the end for me of this particular sighting is that it is so well documented and so well researched to show that something was there and something caused a hole in the cloud. 
that when I tried to look for evidence on this, and there was a lot, there's a lot of pictures. 2006, we all fucking flip phones. Like, no one had, like, the high-quality HD cameras we have on our phones now. People still took pictures. There's blurry pictures of this from all angles of O'Hare. It's fucking awesome. I'm going to post as many of them as I can on our Instagram, all right? What drives me crazy, the most frustrating part, is of for this particular sighting, so many people out there heard of this, and they said, hey, I'm going to make my own picture. And they jumped into Photoshop, or based on the quality of the edits that I found, MS Paint, <laughs> or maybe Mario Paint from the Super Nintendo. What? And decided to jazz this story up with a bullshit image of a UFO floating over O'Hare. Seriously, some of these are the shittiest fakes I've ever seen while doing this show. And I covered the fucking Lizard Man of South Carolina. They're called not so Just deep saying. fakes. What's that? They're called not so deep fakes. Not so deep fakes. These are shallow fakes, folks. And they're atrocious. I found the official ones after I checked the official report. And I was like, okay, I'll take these ones. These ones look good. They're also hard to distinguish going on here, but you can see an object, you know? Yeah. And if you're looking at your thing and like, that looks like a plane. It might look like a plane, but it floated and was soundless. And then it took off at an incredible speed and punched a hole in the sky. And then the FAA and United said there was nothing there. And that's the creepiest part about this. There's so much evidence that shows something was there. It's like, how much more can you lie to people about this? Like, just tell people like, yeah, there was something there. We're investigating it. And here's the thing with Robin's whole, like, it's the, it's the government testing planes. There are governments in this fucking country who tell people it's an unidentified flying object. We don't know what it is. We're looking into it in the interest of national security because it could pose a threat. It could absolutely pose a threat. An article came out today from Harry Reid, former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid of the United States of America, who said stepping away from most of his responsibilities has become more active in the community, stating UFOs exist, the United States government covers it up, it's one thing to cover it up to protect the people, but there's no investigations being done. He makes it sound very reasonable, very logical, these things need to be investigated, it's something that needs to happen. But it's very creepy because he doesn't talk about it in the interest of national security. He talks about it in the interest of international security. All these governments need to know what's going on because it may pose a threat to our world. (laughs) Like, not to our country specifically. And it's so fucking creepy that when I started doing my research, it's like, and here's a new article from Harry Reid talking about UFOs existing and how they're being covered up and not researched. And then I researched this shit and I find that not only did no one check into this, officially no one checked into it they were so bad at lying it's like they didn't even care because part of me thinks okay they're just telling us there's nothing there but they're taking this super seriously you know yeah and then you have someone who's like at the forefront previously of making sure this information wasn't going out into the public telling the public no one's fucking looking into this and they really need to and that for me at least is absolutely terrifying so that's where this one wraps up the November 7th, 2006 UFO sighting at O'Hare International Airport. Nice. So I hope you enjoyed it. I know it was a single incident, but there's so much to it. And the fact that the government was literally caught lying. I just, I had to do it. I had to cover it from start to finish. So hope you enjoyed it. And the second installment of Extraterrestrial October. Thank you. So if anyone has... A ghost story, paranormal, supernatural, true crime, maybe extraterrestrial story that you would like to share with us, please email storytime at scarish.com or go to our website, scarish.com, and click on contact us. Fill out that form. It comes directly to us. You can also hit us up on any of our social medias. Twitter is at scarishpod. Instagram is at scarishpodcast. And Facebook is facebook.com slash scarishpodcast. And we hope to hear from you. You can also join our group on Facebook. If you just go to facebook.com slash scarishpodcast, you'll see our group called the Scarish Spooky Friends. Uh, Jump in there and hang out with us or join us on Discord. Best way to join us on Discord is to go to scarish.com. There's a ticker at the top and up there it'll say join us on Discord. Click that link, follow it, and yeah, you'll be hanging out with us and we have a ton of channels in there for chatting. Robin, for folks who would like to donate to us monetarily and help us buy that haunted house, (laughs) how can they do so? You can go to patreon.com slash scarishpodcast. Those are monthly donations. There's a whole bunch of different tiers to check out. That is also where you will get ad-free episodes. So if you join just for a dollar, you can skip the ads and get straight to the good, nitty-gritty, ear goodness. Uh, you can also go to coffee, ko-fi.com slash scariestpodcast. And those are one-time donations. 
anything that you folks donate to us um, via any of those outlets or while we're streaming on Twitch or anything like that, go to helping us upgrade our studio setup and, and kind of help us keep going and creating more content. And we really couldn't do it without you. Indeed. So thank you to everyone who listens, who writes in, who donates, all those things. It, it means the world to us. We sincerely appreciate it. And we hope you enjoyed episode 148. And I think that's just about everything we have. So, Robin, go ahead and sign us out. Keep on creeping on, and we'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.